And uh, the next speaker is Alex Javorankov uh, from Encilico Medicine, who will speak on uh, deep biomarkers of aging and longevity. Uh, please, Alex. Uh, sure. Thanks so much. Uh, can you see me? Because I, um, yeah. Uh, right. And you can see me. And I'm going to be sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? My screen? But maybe also make it full screen. Uh, now it's a still oh, slide oh, view. Oh, okay, just a second. Uh, and I need to do it like this. All right, guys. So, so for uh, those of you who do not know me, my name is Alex Shavankov. I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Insilico Medicine. Uh, we focus on drug discovery. I'm uh, the chief longevity officer of the company called Deep Longevity, uh, which was recently acquired by uh, uh, another company called Region Pacific uh, and is publicly traded in Hong Kong, where I'm calling from. Uh, so it's uh, almost 2 a.m. my time. Um, uh, since it's a public company, uh, I need to make this disclaimer. So it's not an investment advice. Um, it's uh, publicly traded. Uh, so don't buy the stock based on this lecture. Uh, and um, the technology that I'm specializing in uh, is called deep generative reinforcement learning. So Anton, uh, I've noticed, uh, covered uh, a little bit uh, GANs and variational autoencoders and uh, you know, generation of synthetic data. Uh, so we've been doing this for quite some time, almost since the very dawn of uh, uh, the deep learning revolution. Uh, at, uh, uh, in Silico, uh, we use uh, this technology for biomarker development, biological target identification, molecular screening, molecular generation, clinical trial analysis, and at deep longevity, we do biological age prediction, also biomarker development, uh, biological target identification, uh, synthetic data generation, real world data analytics. And now we even got uh, uh, into motivation, behavioral medication, and mental health and depression. So publications are coming up. Um, uh, actually, in this area, uh, the many features that we work with are highly interpretable, so it's very easy to interpret it with human mind. Um, and uh, the history of deep learning, uh, I'm pretty sure most of you are not familiar with that. Uh, so uh, neural nets, uh, the concepts of neural nets date back to the 1940s, uh, and uh, many of the concepts are not new, but GANs, uh, the topic that was previously touched on, uh, are reasonably new, so uh, Ian Goodfellow introduced them in uh, 2014. Uh, and in 2015, uh, uh, we met Ian and uh, I started working quite uh, actively in this area. And we use it uh, very, very often in uh, molecular generation. Uh, so we uh, published our first uh, uh, paper in uh, generation of novel molecules uh, using GANs uh, in 2016. It's the first peer-reviewed paper uh, in this area. And then we did many, many papers uh, lately showing experimental validation where we synthesize the molecules. Uh, but we also use it to generate synthetic human data. And uh, a very good, uh, uh, very good uh, uh, introduction to GANs uh, and specific application of GANs uh, was uh, this paper by Reed in 2016, uh, published approximately at the same time with ICML when we submitted our um, first paper on molecules. And approximately at the same time, we uh, did our first age predictor using uh, deep neural networks. So you have two networks, one is a generator, another one is a discriminator. The generator is generating meaningful uh, output, meaningful noise in response to textual input or some other generation conditions. And the discriminator is capturing whatever is coming out of the, the generator and comparing it to ground truth. Uh, and those two networks compete with each other. One is trying to trick uh, the discriminator. The discriminator is trying to catch the generator uh, generating fakes. So uh, when they are trained, um, uh, you can get this kind of uh, images, again, 2016, so poor, poor resolution. Uh, you can get this kind of uh, input. This small bird has a pink breast and uh, crown and black primaries and secondaries. Uh, and you, get, you can see that the direction of uh, those generation conditions is, uh, is there. Those are not uh, Google search. These are generated. Um, uh, so GANs are great at uh, generating pictures. Again, those uh, people do not exist. Uh, so this is synthetic data, again, previously touched on, but that's very old stuff. So 2017, 
Uh, and deep neural networks are great at predicting age. Uh, you can see that it can predict age based on synthetic data. Uh, and uh, this kind of brings us to the concept of deep aging clocks. Uh, you can build uh, aging clocks and uh, predictors of age reasonably easy with uh, shallow models. Uh, so you have just uh, one input layer to predict uh, age. Uh, deep models allow you to have uh, many, many neurons on the input, uh, as many as you have uh, input features, and one, uh, one neuron on the output uh, predicting age with many layers of neurons in between uh, in a basic uh, feed-forward uh, network. Um, this is called latent space, uh, hidden layers. Uh, and uh, as this network gets exposed uh, to data, to a lot of data, it learns to predict age with high accuracy. And it can tolerate quite a bit of noise in this data. So if your data isn't perfect, but it's real world data, uh, the deep neural network is great at generalizing. So you, uh, you can embrace dirty data, but you really need to have a very good uh, test set. And uh, we realized that quite early. Uh, so we started using large populational data sets, uh, longitudinal data sets uh, on many, many data types. Um, so we built uh, the first transcriptomic aging clock, proteomic aging clock, methylomic aging clock uh, using deep learning. Uh, we have pictures, uh, EEG, CG activity, blood tests, behavior aging clocks. And you can combine those uh, data types now uh, using deep neural nets, um, either by building ensembles of deep neural nets or training on multimodal data. Uh, and then uh, you can derive pathways, targets, causal graphs, uh, and generate synthetic data using the, the, those deep neural networks. Uh, but this, uh, in 2016, when we first published, uh, that was a pretty novel concept. Uh, and now quite a bit of our, lear our work uh, uh, is related to how to make this uh, concept more explainable and more, um, uh, and, and how do you derive causality from those, uh, from those deep neural networks. Um, one really cool idea that we came up with also in 2016 was to train on age, where a lot of data is available. So everybody has age, that's the beauty of uh, aging, <laughs> uh, to train deep neural networks. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, publicly available data. Um, so you can train deep neural net networks on many of those data types to predict age. And then you retrain them to predict the health status, to predict disease. And then you can look at which uh, uh, features change from age to disease uh, to, to be able to identify the features that are more disease specific rather than age specific. And you can do it within population groups. So again, my group is doing quite a bit of this kind of research. Um, and if you look at the uh, deep biomarkers of aging uh, in history, there are many published uh, in 2016, 2017. Uh, so again, we were the first to publish on hematological aging clocks, uh, got reasonable accuracy from five to uh, seven years. Uh, there were tissue specific transcriptomic clocks. Uh, our accuracy is approximately six years, but can go up all the way to, uh, we can go down all the way to four years when we have enough data. Uh, we also published the microbiome aging clock, uh, about four year accurate. accurate. Um, uh, there were also um, aging clocks published on x-rays, on MRI. You can do it with facial images and many, many other um, omics datas. Uh, we published a clock uh, with uh, a company called Hout AI, with Anastasia Georgievska, uh, on facial images. When you have really high resolution images uh, and really large data sets, uh, high quality data sets. Mean absolute error goes down to 2.3 years. It's uh, pretty much um, almost as, the, as good as methylation clock. Um, and again, there are many, many clocks. We try to have an integrated view uh, on those clocks uh, and combine those clocks uh, in, uh, uh, in a systematic manner either training on multiple data types at the same time or training within the data type and combining those predictors uh, together uh, in a way that average uh, fashion. Um, and currently we have even behavior aging clocks, psychological aging clocks, uh, clocks that are based on uh, medical history. So with very interpretable features um, and uh, working with those kind of data types uh, allow you to uh, to do very advanced feature engineering 
uh, that will later help you to, uh, uh, to work with biological data. So you try to find features that are not directly correlated with uh, biological age, with chronological age, like for example, you know, uh, age of your spouse or age of your children. You don't want to have those uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the features that you're training on because that's very correlated with your kind of, uh, with, 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 with your place in, uh, in, in lifespan. Uh, so it means that you are old enough to have children and uh, uh, they're already kind of, and you have them and uh, you, uh, and they are of specific age or, you know, age of your spouse is very often correlated with your chronological age. So you don't want to have those and you want to have features that are highly modifiable. Uh, so like, for example, features that, you know, age of death of your parents uh, is something <laughs> that you cannot really change. You don't want to have that. Um, and uh, again, learning from easy to interpret data types uh, is very something very important and that helps you define the criteria for feature engineering for other clocks. Um, we have quite a bit of papers uh, supporting those uh, those clocks, uh, uh, you know, all the way since 2015, 2016. Uh, so I'm gonna cover some of those and Paulina Momoshina who is gonna follow uh, with a presentation on more kind of uh, fee, 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 feature importance uh, uh, analysis. Um, uh, we, we did the uh, hematological aging clock. We showed that it works uh, in smokers. Uh, so we can show that uh, smokers uh, um, are predicted to be older uh, than non-smokers. Uh, we built a transcriptomic aging clock, uh, microbiotic aging clock, showed this, those clocks are population specific uh, and also very relevant to mortality. Uh, so the first clock that we published was uh, uh, this deep biomarkers of human aging by Putin. So now I have, I think, eight or nine papers with, uh, with Putin and PubMed. Um, it's funny. Uh, and uh, uh, this was the first application of deep neural networks on blood biochemistry data for age prediction. We also showed that now we can do permutation feature importance. So create a vector of all those features and randomly shuffle some. Uh, to understand which ones contribute most to the accuracy of the predictor and build those beautiful diagrams and see which features are most important. So we've identified albumin, glucose, token of phosphatase back then, uh, and also showed that we can reach a pretty reasonable accuracy, so about uh, five and a half years, uh, and ping some of those features uh, to exact systems. Uh, and also back then we realized that there is anecdotal evidence that people who look older than the chronological age to the deep neural net, uh, they have uh, various health conditions. And people who are younger are usually quite athletic and, uh, uh, and fit. Um, I think I have to accelerate and skip some slides, but uh, for our first study, we used approximately 62,000 samples uh, uh, from people who are more or less uh, healthy uh, and um, trained an ensemble of two, 21 neural nets, uh, stacked them into an ensemble, uh, and um, uh, got to a pretty nice accuracy. So now it's by far much more advanced. Uh, we use a lot of generative systems uh, um, and get to much better relations. Uh, also, we showed that uh, many of those clocks are very responsive to lifestyle choices. So again, the first anecdotal evidence was coming from this first exercise in 2016. Uh, then we showed that uh, on large data sets and Canadian data sets uh, for smokers and Chantix users, um, uh, we showed that people who are uh, smoking, they uh, look much older to the deep neural net uh, early in life. And actually uh, many of those who are, you know, less genetically resilient to aging and other conditions, they die off. Uh, and by the time they're seven younger, they a little bit, uh, they, they are smoking. Uh, and we also showed uh, uh, for the first time that uh, uh, people who are significantly older than the chronological age, so five years or older, uh, also have much higher, higher hazard ratio. So, you know, more, more than two to two, two X chances of dying of any cause within any population um, if they're older than a chronological age and vice versa if they're younger. Uh, so when you're, you test uh, those predictors on data sets that are also annotated for mortality. Uh, we also built a microbionic aging clock, uh, kind of showing that this data might be useful for aging research. Uh, we uh, uh, built a predictor that is four to six years accurate. Uh, and we also showed that some species 
uh, using feature, feature importance uh, and uh, SHAP for analysis, uh, we showed that some of them are more kind of seno negative or, or seno positive. Uh, so some of them uh, make you older or younger. Uh, and um, we integrated many of those clocks uh, into uh, the systems developed by our company called Deep Longevity, which was acquired. Uh, and uh, integrated those clocks into a centralized uh, system, which is called AgeMetric, uh, which kind of grows as you add additional data types uh, into the system. So we can start with pretty much nothing, just asking you how old you feel uh, or, or on your chronological age. And then as you add more data, photo age, uh, methylation aging, heart age, blood age, microbiome age, uh, um, the system grows. Uh, and creates a weighted average uh, of those clocks. Uh, now I have to accelerate because I am out of time. Uh, we provide a web-based system which allows you to track this age metric in time um, uh, and age metric reports to clinics uh, that allow you to interpret those clocks um, uh, in a pretty advanced manner. So you can now see which features make you uh, young, younger or older and which ones should you modify to look younger to the deep neural net? Not necessarily, again, it might not necessarily make you younger, but uh, we have an algorithmic approach which allows you to, to see what you need to change to look younger to the deep neural network. Uh, for example, if you want to take to, to become 10 years younger, what do you, what, which features do you need to change uh, in, in, in your blood? You various interventions, like for example, if you, uh, if, uh, Iron levels uh, is something that is making you uh, look older. Uh, you might want to modulate uh, your uh, iron with uh, iron supplementation or same for cholesterol. So that is that can be modulated with uh, um, statins uh, or glucose or uh, features. And we do the same thing on uh, uh, transcriptomics. And I'll skip a few things actually where to build an ecosystem around those clocks uh, with hospitals, insurance companies, clinical, uh, uh, clinical providers. And um, I think that uh, the idea of uh, employing those techniques for life insurance is a very, very cool uh, idea because in life insurance, the interests of an insurance company and uh, the individual are aligned. And... Uh, so the individual wants to live longer and wants to, of course, ensure that there is a higher premium being paid at the end of life um, to their family. And the insurance company wants to postpone the payout of the premium. So they can provide additional aging clocks uh, and uh, uh, look at, uh, at, at, at what needs to be changed in order for the individual to live longer. Uh, plus, it's a nice perk. So we are developing uh, a system which is, uh, you know, costs you $150 to test uh, uh, all your biological uh, tests, like blood tests, uh, plus a lot of uh, other behavioral and social data uh, to be very predictive of mortality uh, and are collecting now large data sets. Of course, we also use federate learning in cases where it's needed uh, and collaborate with multiple clinics. So if you're a clinic, you can give us a call uh, and we would love to collaborate. Uh, if you are in China, you can add me on WeChat uh, and here is my email. Uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. I think we can still uh, ask uh, two questions. So I'll uh, start uh, with my own question as a moderator. General that's been uh, occupying me. How do you ascertain? Uh, how do you ascertain the reproducibility of the results? Uh, I mean, um, uh, how do you ascertain that the, the results obtained the, with the algorithm on specific data set that was available to you will be also applicable in some other data sets uh, that, that, that you have never seen? Uh, so sure, uh, to do that, you just need to test it on independent data sets. Uh, and from coming from different populations. So the speaker that is going to speak after me, Palina Mamoshana, who has uh, been working with me for over five years now, um, you can look at some of her papers. And uh, uh, here, this paper, Population Specific Biomarkers of Human Aging, a big data study of South Korean, Canadian, and Eastern European populations, published in Gerontology Section 8, a uh, really cool journal. Uh, is, I think, one of the first studies where we uh, showed that we can train uh, those uh, deep neural networks within different populations, so Koreans, Canadians, Eastern Europeans, 
uh, and then test Korean uh, data on Canadian predictor, for example, to look at you know which features are different, uh, which features are the same, uh, how does the performance of one predictor compare it to another, uh, and uh, you can combine some of those predictors as well. Um, and that was the first time when we showed that uh, uh, you can also test on uh, uh, data sets that contain mortality data uh, within every population and then on a combined predictor uh, and showed that uh, uh, that phenomenon that we've identified uh, that I talked about in, in one of the slides that uh, you know if you are five years or older in every population uh, your hazard ratio increases. Uh, thanks, and uh, kind of combined question from uh, David Winsutif is is the um, uh, is the prediction of age from facial photography is it influenced uh, by makeup, uh, my sunburn, transit, emotional state, and uh, John Furbrad's uh, uh, would it be influenced if somebody um, uh, stayed up all night? Uh, what was your? Yes, of course. So um, it's it's highly sensitive. Uh, and again, it kind of shows you the limitations and benefits of deep neural networks. Uh, uh, if, if, if you were to Photoshop your, 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 your face uh, or apply makeup, the deep neural network would be confused and think that you are, uh, you are younger. And uh, the best company that uh, I know, and I'm an advisor to that company as well, is called Hout AI. Uh, which does this kind of research on different uh, photographic data types, either on very ultra high resolution pictures of skin. Uh, so you don't even do it, you can do it on this uh, uh, macro, uh, and, sorry, sorry my, my micro pictures of your skin. Uh, and you can do it on uh, entire face. Uh, features are making you younger or older. Uh, and then you can correct those features. You also see what those features are on the photograph, uh, either on the full face or on the specific, uh, specific uh, piece, uh, piece of the skin. Uh, and you would be able to influence some of those uh, features using makeup, but of course, uh, you know, sleep and exercise um, your body composition. Uh, if you have a lot of subcutaneous body fat, you will actually look younger um, because the wrinkles are corrected. Um, uh, and how, but, 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 and how your mood uh, changes your uh, uh, your age. What we also found is that if you just train on the population, if you smile and show your teeth, uh, uh, the deep neural network will recognize you as younger. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh...